Good, good morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Silva. I'm the moderator for this panel. Um, I'm the executive director for Habitat for Humanity in Puerto Rico, the uh, an affiliate of Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, we've been incorporated in Puerto Rico and have been working for the past 20 years. I have been the executive director for the past 10 years. And uh, Habitat's basic mission is to provide a safe and affordable home for, fam for low-income families. And the idea is to do it in collaboration with the families. The families that are um, selected as partners of Habitat need to comply with 320 hours of construction work in their homes, 80 hours of educational workshops that help them become uh, a responsible homeowner, and they pay a no-interest mortgage. And the idea with these two uh, requirements is that it is not seen as charity, that they're working towards their, their new future, and also that they pay it forward. With that uh, payment, they're helping us to be able to help out other families as well. So um, we are in charge today. Uh, the theme is housing, which to me, I've been involved with 10 years. I think it's one of the most important aspects when a natural disaster occurs. Uh, you first have to attend the emergency aspect, but after that, what, it doesn't matter if it's a hurricane or an earthquake, what uh, it mostly is impacted uh, is the house of, of where the people live. And if people don't have a stable home, a stable environment, they, they cannot think about anything else. So with me today, I'm very excited because I have three uh, very um, important panelists. I would like to introduce them and let you know the ideas that we're gonna, they're gonna talk about what they do what are they doing right now? We're going to open it to questions and then see how we can all work together to help Puerto Rico rebuild better. So we thank you for being here today. Um, we have Jennifer Inojosa. Inojosa. Inojosa, sorry if I'm pronouncing it. Um, Jennifer is a research associate and data center coordinator for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at, here at Hunter College and the City University of New York. We have also a Erika Ruiz, she's the Director of Enterprise uh, Advisors, Enterprise Community Partners. And with us through uh, Zoom is Monica Alicia Amados. She's an architect, faculty member at the School of Architecture and Design at the Catholic University of Santiago in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and leads the Retoño Puerto Rico Initiative. We're gonna start uh, with Jennifer, which is gonna talk about uh, what they're doing uh, right now to help rebuild for the people. So, um, as Amanda was saying, I work for Centro, and um, so right, we're planning on releasing a report related to housing crisis in Puerto Rico and the impact of Hurricane Maria. So, um, this report should be coming out in two weeks. Um, so, I'd like to discuss just a, very briefly what the report is, but um, what it is is basically showing how the housing crisis was brewing right before Hurricane Maria because of the economic crisis that's happening in Puerto Rico. So, so to provide a context, right, as of, 20, um, as of 2016, this is using census data, right, 18% of um, homes in Puerto Rico are vacant. Now, if you go to the census website, it would say 20%. But what we did was that we took away the homes that were used as vacation homes or um, second homes for um, Puerto Rico, for families who are residing here, but that's their second home, but it's vacant, right? So there's some type of like ownership. But getting back to it, 18% of the homes um, are vacant in Puerto Rico. Um, and back in 2006, that was 11%. So it has increased over time. And um, so, with that being said, we also see the foreclosure um, rate has increased as well. So in order to track that data central, what we are doing is trying to provide all of that data um, available to nonprofits or um, <coughs> folks, academic, non-academic <coughs> folks. Um, so what we're doing is trying to harvest all of this information to see what's happening now. Um, but one thing to sort of take note is anything post Hurricane Maria to grab any type of data, it's very, very difficult. Even trying to communicate with the government, how is um, um, the Departamento de Vivienda, it's very difficult to uh, obtain such data, even so with FEMA as well. So if you go to your programs right here, and if you see that map, um, and we're working, for example, with David Castillo, who's here, and he was able to provide such data in terms of like homes that were damaged due to flooding, um, the roof damages or foundation damages. 
But the point is this, is that what Centro is doing is trying to provide this type of information. So, um, for example, um, is that humanity or enterprise or other organizations that want to go to a specific town or municipio here in Puerto Rico, they're able to see or have a sense of idea, well, this is what it looks like um, um, in this type of, um, um, in, in this county. And also, too, with um, projects that are going on in Puerto Rico, if you're working on housing, if right, you have students who want to rebuild homes or whatnot, we're, we're trying to sort of facilitate that through our website. Um, Another thing that this report touches on is that, hey, if 18% of these homes are vacant, right, why not use them for social purposes, right? So obviously there's gonna be some type of return migration going to happen, right? But if their homes are destroyed, right, why rebuild homes from the scratch, you know, from, from the bottom up when you have these homes that are already um, available. But the thing is this, is that we need to locate where these homes are located to see if they have been any, if they've been damaged, right? Um, so basically, where do we go from here is to show that, hey, there are these tools and you don't have to be a GIS person or a technical person, but it's to provide these friendly user apps to show um, these are the locations. This was the impact um, of the hurricane um, Maria, but also we're in constant contact with FEMA to have updated information, right? So um, again, so this report will come out in two weeks. It's in the editing phase. <laughs> I promise you, here it is. <laughs> um, but um, not to get into facts, but I think more so, um, you know, it's very important to have such reports and to get the information out there. I mean, a lot of people are very shocked to see, well, hey, 18% of homes are vacant, right? And when we compare that 18% with other states here, in, um, Puerto Rico has the highest percentage of vacant homes, right? Now, again, um, and, and I think, um, was it Maine and Vermont? have like 13% or 12% the highest. So 18 to 13%, that's pretty a large gap. Um, also another thing to look into, I don't know if I'm going over my time, um, but um, we're able to obtain data of housing, of homes that have been sold. So for example, an appraisal will say this home is worth 120,000. What we're seeing is that that home has been sold, has been sold for like 80,000. So people who have this home for a very long time are losing money. So any type of equ equity, homes are being depreciated. So that's one thing that we point out um, in our report. So in a nutshell, there was already a housing issue going on pre um, Hurricane Maria. Now it's completely, and I, I believe if you get, we'll get into it a little bit more, but the field work aspect, based on this data, we don't know what's gonna happen one or two years from now, it could get worse. Um, but I think overall, the point of this is that hopefully we can use these homes for to rebuild it. I mean, um, the CBD money is coming, right? But how that will be reused or distributed is something that I think a lot of these counties will need to know, you know, how to go about doing that. Hopefully with these tools that we have, I don't know okay. if um, we might have time, but um, all of this information is available on our website. So if you yeah, want to gonna ask, yeah. let, let people know how they're going to, how you're going to disseminate the, the report yes. and so that they can access it. So, or comments or anything like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if you go to our website, um, there we have this part that says we build Puerto Rico. So we have, if you go to our data hub, Right, and I'll distribute my cards. And if you have any questions, you could just let me know afterwards. Um, you have two maps: one for Puerto Rico, and then one for the U.S. Right, and I'll, I'll explain how that connects. Right, but for Puerto Rico, all the FEMA data that we were, um, well, David was able to clean for us, um, all of that information is there, and you could see at the block group, um, at the zip code level and the county level, the number of homes that have been damaged. But again, please note that this data is not updated. So this is data from David, I think it was like January 2018. No, it is, is, is it updated? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah, he's our, I don't know if you want to present yourself just so people know you're the. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So he was very integral in sort of um, helping us to sort obtain of data in the data and the mapping. So um, again, so if you go to our website, um, if you go to Data Hub, all of this information is available. And we're, again, we're still trying to add more, more layers. Website. And the website is um, central PR, centralpr.hunter.cuny.edu. Okay. Um, if you go to the data center, so there's a lot of clicks. If you go to research, <laughs> the data center, you will see all of our reports there. So we have um, all of our reports, our research briefs, policy briefs are located there. But the new thing, the new um, component that we have here is the data. And that's something that we're making it available for other um, nonprofits or startup companies that want to go there and help. Well, hey, here's the information. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And um, so yeah, the report will come on soon. So, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I now present you Erika Ruiz from Enterprise. Uh, talk a little about what they're doing. Okay, great. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here um, as part of this activity to present about Enterprise and our work in Puerto Rico. Um, I'm currently leading our efforts in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands um, as part of the Enterprise Advisors Group, which is a consulting arm of Enterprise. Uh, we're a national nonprofit started in 1982. Um, based out of Columbia, Maryland, but again, we have offices in various parts of the country. And our focus and mission is to provide opportunities for affordable housing and community development. Um, so we've been supporting um, affordable housing and community development in Puerto Rico for many years. So we have um, three kind of activities that we do as enterprise. We invest, we provide capital, um, we provide solutions, um, and public policy. So we're using that format and that, um, that structure to also provide resources to Puerto Rico. So um, over the last couple of years, we provided um, technical assistance and capacity building to the nonprofit affordable housing sector in Puerto Rico. Um, so we've done that through training and grants. Um, there's a current grant opportunity now available for um, nonprofit groups across the country, but in particular groups that have been um, are in disaster um, communities. So again, um, that information will be available on our site um, for section four um, dollars for nonprofits. So a couple of things that we've done before, we've also um, provided assistance to municipalities directly. Um, we worked with San Juan and Mayagüez, and we also provided technical assistance to the Commonwealth and the development of the um, state housing plan, the 2014 to 2018 housing plan that's still active in Puerto Rico. So. That's a kind of a, a, a snapshot of what, we're, what we've done before. Since Hurricane Maria, um, we've provided some um, grants to 11 groups in Puerto Rico through our Hurricane Recovery Fund. Um, you know, we've also been very active on the Hill for advocacy for, for federal dollars for technical assistance and capacity. So that yielded as a $15 million pot of funds from HUD that'll be available for those efforts. Um, we're currently working with the University of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rico Home Builders Association on a resiliency manual. So that's again, one of our, our areas of expertise is resilience. And it's a resilience manual for multifamily and single family housing. So that will be available later this year. And there'll be subsequent training for the industry and for homeowners as well. And so we just last month, we were able to gather about 100 experts in Puerto Rico to, to really talk about resiliency strategies and really have a, a, cross a cross section of various parties involved in the development down to community members, architects, engineers, et cetera. So really we all have to be at the table to be able to talk about these strategies and collaborations. We're also, we also participated in the old meeting. So again, um, the municipalities have a critical role in recovery, and we were able to provide some disaster recovery <laughs> 101 to the municipalities and help them understand the process, the federal funds that are coming in, and how to help inform the process and the development of the programs and strategies around that funding. Um, we're also actively involved in the drafting of the governor's plan for recovery, the 12 to 24 month recovery plan, which includes housing as one of the areas of focus in addition to 10 other areas. So that will be submitted to Congress on August 8th. And we're working collaboratively with those on the ground in Puerto Rico on the development of the housing strategies, addressing things as vacant housing, damaged housing, public um, foreclosures and, uh, and resilience. Um, we're also in development of a capacity building program. So one of, uh, one of my passions definitely is supporting the nonprofit sector and um, over the years, again, we're able to provide some limited resources, but 
one of the things we want to establish in Puerto Rico is a permanent uh, resource for capacity building and training in a variety of areas for not just the housing sector, but for nonprofits overall. They're such a critical component of the recovery process, and there's an, a need for an investment in their long-time sustainability as organizations. Um, they wouldn't be able to contribute um, to the best of their ability without um, some more investment in them as organizations. Um, we're also looking at developing some housing pilots in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, some temporary to permanent housing solutions that are sustainable. And um, we're also looking, lastly, not lastly, I think we're, we continue to come up with, with different um, strategies working with our partners. Um, this is disaster planning um, collaborative pilots in four communities in Puerto Rico, uh, San Juan, Ponce, Caguas, and Mayagüez having the nonprofit sector, the private sector, anchor institutions, and municipalities collaborate um, on resiliency um, strategies and disaster preparedness. And again, even going down to the methodology of collection of information to be able to address needs in the community. Um, so that is what we're doing. And I guess we'll talk a little more about how we can collaborate, but thank you. Thank you, Erica. So now joining us from, uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador is architect Monica Alicia Matos. She's a faculty member at the School of Architecture and Design at the Catholic University of Santiago in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And she leads the Retoño Puerto Rico initiative. Welcome. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, <laughs> buenos dias. Great, buenos dias. Um, so first of all, I wanna just thank Centro for inviting us to be part of this discussion. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Retoño Puerto Rico and the work that we've been doing, the challenges that we've faced in the process. Mm -hmm. um, Retoño Puerto Rico is an initiative that was born from a group of professionals um, from the Puerto Rican diaspora that, like everyone else, was growing in desperation in the hours following the impact of the hurricane. Um, being far away from home and not being able to help, we realized that there is a huge community of design and construction professionals outside of Puerto Rico that not only have a vast and diverse experience, but most importantly, want to help in Puerto Rico's recovery. Um, so we wanted to know how we could harness that talent and those people. Uh, we developed a concept for an initiative that wants to act as a bridge between academia as a generator of knowledge, professional practice as a translator of that knowledge into action, and community organizations who are on the ground helping impacted communities to work towards a locally driven recovery. Um, we understood from the beginning that one of the biggest issues in the recovery phase uh, would be the duplication of efforts um, and that this would be aggravated by the interruption of the island's communication systems. Um, at the beginning, essentially, nobody could communicate with each other and the people that were on the outside were the only ones that would actually be able to help even in efforts such as what you've been mentioning regarding mapping, et cetera. Um, so for this reason, we decided to create an online platform back then that would allow us to document existing initiatives that were happening per sector, per municipality, that we could not only help connect projects and individuals on the island at the time when they could not communicate with each other, but um, also gather and organize the design and construction community in the diaspora by expertise and then direct them towards opportunities to get involved with active projects and organizations. Um, in terms of housing, our, our mission is to advocate for a locally driven solutions for resilient reconstruction. One of the big challenges that we, we face as architects in terms of housing is uh, the urgency of providing people with homes and the time it takes for the funds to be allocated leads to temporary solutions that most of the times end up being permanent. Um, that is what we advocate for temporary to permanent alternatives or the potential of building reuse, which is something that I know we're going to be also talking about today. Um, informal housing is a big issue in Puerto Rico with 55% of the houses built without a construction permit and not up to the construction codes. And one of the big challenges is that there is a gap that exists between the professionals and the actual communities. On the one hand, we have professional organizations that are the voice and the driving force behind professionals in Puerto Rico, and they are committed to the enforcement of construction codes and refuse to support any projects of reconstruction in flood zones. And then on the other, we have families that have lived in their communities sometimes for generations, and they don't want to leave their homes, and they 
end up rebuilding on their own with the help of volunteers that have no experience in uh, safe construction. Uh, we need to recognize that informality is not going to disappear and try to find ways to mitigate these risks, risks to which uh, they are exposed. Um, currently in Puerto Rico, uh, there's a large amount of design professionals who are, despite of their technical training, they're unable to engage with communities because of a lack of expertise in participatory design. So this means that the people like me that are trained to make safe construction are not being able to approach or find the channels through which they can assist communities with their expertise. So that is one of the problems that we identified that gap that was happening between them. So this makes, in our opinion, community organizations and leaders vital to achieving a locally driven recovery because they hold the relationships and trust of the members of the community. Um, as part of the initiative, we organized a series of inter-university talks with the support of the University of Puerto Rico, the University uh, Universidad del Turabo, and the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico. Uh, in addition, we participated in the Puerto Rico Restart International Project and Research Workshop, <laughs> and where we had students, professionals, and community organizations collaborating in the development of proposals for specific communities. Um, we have run into some challenges in the journey, which we, which I understand we also need to talk about, which is uh, disaster fatigue. People after a few months actually start getting unmotivated, uh, less involved in voluntary work, um, coordination challenges, managing people all across the globe also present a problem. Um, but we, we do think there is great potential in harnessing that talent that was exported outside of Puerto Rico. Uh, so, in terms of what's upcoming for us, uh, we want to continue to augment our capacity and connect professionals with community organizations to help close that gap between informal and formal housing. And we will also continue to engage our network in the diaspora and try to uh, run online educational campaigns about safe construction um, that are specifically in a graphic language that's gears, geared toward the general population. Um, also, something important is uh, basically the cumbersome post-disaster processes that even professionals and members of the community are not familiar with. So how do we actually get that information across to them? Um, I think these uh, resilient housing design actually is not, doesn't stand on its own. It needs to address like sensitive community planning, green infrastructure, um, even small scale farming, etc. cetera. Um, and we will continue to advocate for these values. Um, thank you, I'm happy to just um, talk about how we can actually collaborate with each other to get this, this project done. Yeah. I think um, this panel is all about collaboration. I think we represent um, uh, the importance of having data and how mm -hmm. we use that effectively. Erica, in terms of uh, enterprise and what they provide, you know, mm -hmm. the macro part and, and, the, and the knowledge to be able to be trickled down. Monica, which is all these uh, professionals that want to help Puerto Rico, all this knowledge that it's able to be able to to brought uh, to Puerto Rico and the organization that I represent, which is Habitat for Humanity Puerto Rico, that is one of the organizations that does the direct service. Mm -hmm. How do we all integrate together with people like yourself that are interested in in helping Puerto Rico? And like I said, uh, in what are uh, the theme of this panel is housing and how we pass, we're already in, the past the part of the emergency uh, relief, we're now in the long-term relief, and how housing is such an integral part of uh, life in, after a natural disaster. That's what, when a natural disaster occurs, what it affects is, is the household. And if they don't have a safe and secure place to live, the person cannot think about anything else. You know, you cannot think about, you know, taking your kids to school or other, so, Puerto Rico and any other place uh, is affected by, by that. So we need to see how we can work together and, and provide a solution that is also impl implemented by Puerto Ricans. So uh, mm -hmm. right now we want to bring it up to discussion. Uh, we were letting uh, you know what we're doing, but now we want to see how we can collaborate uh, for the good of Puerto Rico. So does anyone know? Yes. Um, you want to? Can you say your name? Sure, my name is uh, Thomas Lopez Pierre. I'm, uh, I live on the west side of Manhattan. I'm a, I'm a candidate for city council and I'm a, a, a yeah, affordable housing advocate. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Um, one is politics and one is policy. So just, just for that and data. 
So for the, the young lady for, from Enterprise, um, how are you guys funded? Are you guys a, a corporate-based organization where banks started you, or are you a, like a do-good, not-for-profit? We, we have a little bit of everything under the umbrella of what is the enterprise family. So I work for the partner side, which is the nonprofit side. So we get funded. A lot of the work that I do, um, specifically in the advisors, is funded through direct contracts with um, nonprofits, housing authorities, city government, um, and sometimes state so were, groups. Were you guys funded by, um, started by banks? Um, like, not necessarily. I, I just want to know if there's corporate interest behind your organization. That's, well, no, I don't think we were not started by banks. Um, we were started by um, a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Rouse. I'm happy to provide more information. But we're a 501c3 in one part, and we have a different structure for our capital investments and lending. Um, so we're kind of a lot of different animals within one organization, but I specifically work for the nonprofit side. Okay. So then, um, and I'm going to be quick. And on the data side, you spoke that 18% um, of the housing was vacant. So my question is, um, usually in situations you have vacancy rates, but then you have people living in substandard housing. So do you have any idea of what percentage of, of the residents of Puerto Rico are living in housing that most people would consider substandard? And is there an agenda to help provide them, um, you know, services to help them get their housing up to what we would call respectable standards? And then also a data question is, um, uh, anytime there is a, uh, a, uh, um, a war or, or, or a disaster, uh, capitalists will see this as an opportunity to come and make money. So on the housing front, is most of the housing in Puerto Rico home ownership, or are we seeing in, um, outside interests saying this is a great opportunity to buy multifamily housing and exploit um, either through government dollars or through pri um, private uh, rent payers an opportunity to, to, to make a buck on the, the pain and suffering of Puerto Rico? Okay. Oh, and I'm Dominican Puerto Rican Haitian. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, to answer the kind of inter two questions, kind of interweave, but um, in terms of like data, it's very difficult to obtain data for Puerto Rico. So, for example, there's a census program. Um, you have the American Housing Survey. Puerto Rico does not participate in that. So when we start looking at how those homes, um, which is very important to have that data but the data that we have that we are able to use is um, from the american um, u.s census bureau american community survey right but the problem with that is that the data that's the most recent is 2016. so we need to think about we have 2017 and 2018 and i'm pretty sure that the rate of vacancy rate um, which is 18 percent is probably i'm sorry 18 percent is probably much higher now but we don't have that info and the next census that's going to come out it's going to be for um 2017, that's not coming out till next year. So um, to even have that true number, it's very difficult to obtain that. Um, but um, your question about this capitalist, um, we, I mean, we're trying to obtain data in relation to that. Um, for example, the foreclosure homes, um, we've heard that some of the banks are trying to sort of keep it because people are gonna come back to Puerto Rico. They're going to come back, but if their homes are already damaged, they're going to be looking for other homes to, to perhaps purchase or whatnot. Um, so I'm not too sure how to well, answer that question. In, when we but, saw in Detroit, where they came in and they purchased these homes by hundreds of thousands yeah. of banks, right? and then turned the homeowners into renters, do we see something like that possibly do with it? Perhaps. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't really have for sure answer for that. No, I mean, I think. Um, and, and that's why I was asking about your funding, because mm -hmm. what we see is we see, on one hand, we see corporations doing the so-called good good mm -hmm. to set up the platform so that they can come later on. And yeah. Profit. So well, I don't know if you heard the first part, that our mission is to develop affordable housing and community development in communities, particularly for low-income um, communities and individuals and families. And so I think on our partner side, you know, we have federal, philanthropic, private donations, et cetera. So we, you know, it comes from a variety of resources, but our, our, our interest is to make sure that we help create and, and, and um, fortalize the affordable housing community because it's central to the, the development of people um, to have stable, safe, sanitary housing. Um, I would say as far as the investments as are concerned, there are investments in things like the low income housing tax credit that is a vehicle for creating those opportunities in the rental space. Um, and think in Puerto Rico, there is a high value home ownership. Um, that is something that is um, 
just been consistent in the history of Puerto Rico is to own your own home and to have your own plot of land. And I think a lot of the strategies that have been outlined in previous plans supports that, the, um, the rehabilitation of your home. I think now there is a big focus on the, I hate to use the term kind of informal housing, but the lack of a better term, um, regarding being able to make those safe spaces. Um, we're also very concerned about the displacement of, of low-income communities from, from, from um, vulnerable places, but we also are, are concerned about safety of, of, of um, individuals. So for us as an organization, we have expertise, we work in a lot of areas. We have an office here in New York. Uh, we were involved a lot with Sandy, um, but we rely a lot on working collaboratively um, with those on the ground in Puerto Rico. Again, it's like, you know, it's, it's not a community that we're based out of. Um, my, myself, I'm Puerto Rican. My family lives there now in Aguada. It's part of what you would call possibly this informal housing sector with certain issues as a result of the storm. So for me, it's a personal investment to give back to Puerto Rico. And, um, and my interest is the well-being of the Puerto Rican people. And I know that there's a lot of vehicles as far as financing a concern. And there's also that disaster um, disaster vulture culture, is the way I like to call it. That exists in every opportunity, right? Whether it's a natural disaster, or man-made disaster, or economic disaster, anything else, that there's always gonna be those um, predators. Those predators. Um, so I would say I'm not really sure, I haven't been hearing a lot about, um, there are some of that, but I haven't heard at the large scale as far as housing, you know, with people being removed from land, et cetera, but I think that there is a concerted effort for um, safety, security, resiliency, and preservation also getting those who out migrated, um, you know, due to the housing circumstances to, to be able to come back to Puerto Rico that's stronger and better and more supportive of them as a person. And data wise, it's really hard to track that. <laughs> Thank like, you. Yeah. yeah um, just to kind of uh, make sure I have a question, but uh, the New York Times reported on that. Could, could you introduce so, yourself, please? Oh, uh, Max yeah. Norad. Um, uh, yes, the vulture capitalists are down there, and uh, especially the, the equity, uh, the, um, the private venture capitalists, equity funds that owned all the, they, they're, they're, um, yeah, they, and they were there before. We that, that's right. So, maybe, so this was happening so before this Maria, is, yes, that's and on the top. It's, it's accelerated. <clears throat> My question goes to the model of ownership, right? Um, and, and, uh, uh, there was a great tradition of Puerto Rico of La Parceras, mm -hmm. which were, you know, grew out of the Munoz Marin era. That, and, and, and that was meant to be uh, housing uh, for, for home uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. Over the decades, it turned into a speculative market because people would accumulate equity and then they would sell it off mm -hmm. and then they wouldn't have housing. And it, it just became what it wasn't supposed to be. Um, and my... So part of, part of what, what, I, what I see happening in Puerto Rico is that, they, that the ownership models are very confused. Titles are extremely confused. You could not, you really, there, there's almost, it's almost uninsurable, right? You cannot get homeowner insurance, not homeowner insurance, title insurance in Puerto Rico. Uh, I mean, you have to really pay a lot of money for that. Um, we have a model of, of ownership here in New York City, which I happen to be fortunate enough to live in, which is the limited equity. Uh, are you familiar with limited, limited equity? Limited equity co-op? Yeah, limited equity. And uh, my, my question is, to what extent can that model work? Even though, I mean, here in New York City, we build up, which I suggest Puerto Rico would do well to build up rather than build out, because there's no land. But uh, is, as an ownership model, uh, it, it, it affords people a sense of ownership uh, without the speculative uh, side of it because you cannot, it's not fungible in the market, right? You cannot, you, you, you can't sell it, uh, but you do have an ownership position. Uh, and would kind of harken back to the Parcelas, which I thought was, I mean, my reading of that with Munoz Marin did was that he wanted to have people have housing, not, you know, not be, you know, parlaying into equity loans and stuff. So, uh, is there, are, are you guys dealing with the ownership models and the title uh, issues, the legal issues that are involved in home, home ownership? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can take a little. So one of the things as part of this report um, that's going to Congress is that we are looking at the, the title issue, which 
which the informal housing, if you want to define it as broad as possible, I mean, there's a lot of different um, definitions for it. It's like one not having a clear title to land, mm -hmm. right? Having any type of documentation that you own the particular land where you built your property or the subdivision of land that you do own. But again, if it, there was no permit or there's no documentation for that, um, or you, right, you built without permit. He owned the land, you built, uh, so all sorts of different definitions, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. The spontaneous communities, communities that, um, you know, self-built, um, and all of that. So I think that um, everyone's been talking about it. We're, we're looking at the issue. Um, we've engaged with um, the legal community as well here who have worked with um, other groups. And I'm not as familiar with this, but I have a large team that I'm working with who yeah. have different subject areas. But I know this was an issue in, um, in Louisiana. Yeah. And um, Puerto Rico does have a registry for a certain, I think it was about 80,000 units that are mm -hmm. informal, but it's not, it's not comprehensive, right? This isn't talking about all the different cases that I just kind of outlined, which I'm not even touching all the variables. Um, but we actually do have um, folks on our team that have lived, uh, who are from Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico now, who are basically developing that type, the topography of the different informal housing types and the different um, pathways for for formalization, right? Um, depending on, because it's, it's an important issue because a lot of the cases for FEMA were, were declined because of that documentation. Yeah. And so that, that um, and also, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah, sure. for, for uh, organizations such as Habitat for Humanity mm -hmm. that we have to abide by laws, um, you, it's, you know, we think it's not important to have title, but it is, I cannot go into someone's home and start building without, if I don't have the permission of the person who has title to the house. So it's also, yeah. it's, it has that importance and as well. Yeah. And it's a, it's a structural issue too with, um, you know, Puerto Rico currently, as far as I know, the last time when I was there about this week has eight inspectors for the entire island. So it's like, they're not, that's that's not creating a culture of enforcement, of, of creating permits. You know, again, um, you know, this was a conversation I had with the planning board. They're like, all right, a lot of the, un, um, the un informal construction takes place on the weekend. So like, we don't work on the weekends, right? So, you know, like there's just a lot of, there's been a, a this didn't happen overnight, right? We're talking about long-term um, housing, but there are, we're looking at, I think now everybody's paying attention, right? Because of the extent of the damage um, was light on the problem. very um, disproportionately affected the um, informal housing, right? So it's kind of like, well, now how are we, how are we creating pathways to, to mitigate that? And how are we moving forward with creating systems and processes without penalization? That's another thing, but be very considerate of people that's like, it, it wasn't just because people wanted to do whatever they wanted, right? That's not the case per se. It's a, it existed. It, it's a lot of different variables and factors. So I think we're looking at it from a lot of different angles. That's, how do you take the speculation out? Is the other question, because that's the issue. How do you find a solution to address the, the, this gentleman over here about you know you can't buy what's not worth anything. You know what I'm saying on the market. So are you building in a prophylactic to to that that kind of speculation? into the model, the, the ownership model? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of Habitat, our mission is to, we uh, provide, what we want to provide is families ownership so they do have a leg up in, in, in life. So Habitat's model is not rent, rent, it is home ownership because having title to the property and if you use it correctly, it's gonna help you you know, not only have a stable home, but you can use it uh, correctly to, to get a, a head in life because of the the model that we have. Um, I was just going to go back in terms of what our strategy is going to be in Puerto Rico. Uh, of we took these uh, months to analyze the situation. We're going to be doing uh, reconstruction, new construction, but also as an enterprise is doing, and hopefully we'll be doing it together. The problem of the parcelas, uh, Puerto Rico is an agricultural society. It went to industrial. He gave out the parcelas, but uh, you have to summarize, you have two types of informal. The people who, um, for lack of a better term, in, uh, invaded uh, uh, yeah. a plot of land because they didn't have to go. But also you have a lot of people, the, those parcelas, uh, the, the grandfather inherited and now they're, um, now it's, uh, they didn't do the legal process. Right. 
because in my opinion, to simplify it, the cost of living in Puerto Rico doesn't go uh, uh, with what uh, the earnings. So what people do is they start uh, doing the second level, uh, their, their father's house, and then they start and they don't do the legal process. So we're investing in sponsoring. Uh, it's difficult, but it's it's at the root of the problem, mm -hmm. and uh, we think, and it's time. You, if we don't solve that, right. if we don't invest in that, we're we're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what what's what's happening, and that's what also I believe causes the social problems that Puerto Ricans are, are facing. You know, when you li too many people living together, it's good. It's all right for a couple of days, months, but you know, <laughs> it, it's not the great. And you have you know situation. You know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, people who are living with kids that are not the kids if you're just living in the, in the same household in the same room it's just not a, a great uh a model to 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 follow so we're going to be investing in in title and also in in capacity building as well and, and having people and homeowners educated in terms of being able to um and know that they're if they are getting the if it's good quality of work what they're what mm -hmm. they had the person that they hired we also found out that a lot of the trades people that they hire it's not because they want to gain more income it's that they really don't know how to build correctly yeah. so we're we're investing in those things but our model uh, we believe that through home ownership mm -hmm. is where they're going to have an investment they're going to be able to you know uh, have a say in, in what's just to touch on informal housing, I know that a lot of um, folks are interested in where are these informal housing located, right? Because I think that's also key to see where they located, what is the impact of that? I don't, so what we've been trying to do, it's first it's hard to get any type of shape file, like to actually show that in a map, right? Because obviously there's no titles to it. So we've been in contact with Homeland Security because they do have like parcel data. But what we just received is actually imagery data. So what we do is that we grab those images before and after, and we're able to map. And I wish I could show you like um, on, on our website, but basically with the informal housing, we're hoping to actually grab those imagery data and see to parcel out, this is the number of homes, this is the location, mm -hmm. and this is the impact. So what you see in our program here, we were hoping to have that type of information here because mm -hmm. clearly, Nothing is, I mean, I'm not too sure what is being done, but it, it could help out to visualize this is the, you know, information that's out there in terms of um, informal housing. But it's very difficult to have any type of data related to that. I want to add, um, sorry. <laughs> I want to add to what, to what you just said. Um, I think it's important to actually start kind of overlaying the information as well, because like you're saying, you're kind of, you at Centra are starting to map out all of the informal housing areas, but the problem is also that we need to map out what are all of the available properties that we can actually use as well. And I think if we were able to make that assessment, we can actually overlay that information and notice that, you know, we have a problem of actually uh, people not having titles to their properties, to their houses, but then we also have a massive amount of houses and other types of buildings, even schools that are out there that are usable and that there is really no assessment of their condition, their usability. There's no legal mechanism to actually gain or transfer the property titles. So mm -hmm. there's like, I believe there's a there's also a, a responsibility for advocacy with government agencies to create those legal mechanisms mm -hmm. to actually use these properties. Um, yeah. and, and that's, I think it, it's something that, that you guys are doing that's very interesting. Most definitely, because the layers, if we have the layers of how many families are living in that area, or even people with disability, how many with children, all of that data is available, but this is a problem. So we have the data, the, the imagery data, but it is, it is thousands upon thousands of images. So once I, for example, if I was just, just to grab Vieques, right, and I put it in my program, my computer shuts down. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, I'm, again, it is very important to have that information out there. So I know Centro, we're trying our best to have that information out there, but we need to make sure that it's clean it's usable and it's reliable. So, yeah. Um, my name is Walter Alomar. I'm from the organization for Culture of Hispanic Origins. Uh, we're based out of New Jersey. Uh, 
I spent nine weeks in Puerto Rico uh, repairing the power lines. I worked alongside FEMA and Army Corps of Engineers here in the West. And uh, I did a film called Colonization is Extinction that talks about the economic crisis in Puerto Rico and how it got from the Z. I want to know if, uh, or do you know, or is your company perhaps uh, in the process of creating a disaster plan for Puerto Rico? Or perhaps like uh, disaster shelters? Mm -hmm. Because obviously, um, you know, since the hurricane and all that damage has happened in the state of current people are in, uh, you have to have a plan. Right. Because it's you know the islands and so on and so forth, we may continue to suffer these, these same types of problems. So, <clears throat> do you know, or is you know perhaps your nonprofit in the process of creating some kind of disaster emergency plan so that you know when hurricanes come again, mm -hmm. people will have their avenues on how to live, how to maintain, where to go, what to do, food, medicine, water, etc. So, we're going to go through this whole right. So, so, so we're not. Uh, so, enterprise is not creating that for the island, but we are working. Um, we will be some working in five communities. Um, one, actually, one in Saint Croix. For Puerto Rico, um, on that community level, just kind of um, disaster preparedness and planning, you know, involving just you know again with the municipalities and nonprofits, public sector, etc., so that the communities are able to better understand what their vulnerabilities are, you know, within a, that community um, as a whole, and be able to effectively to, to figure out what resources they're missing. Um, you know, I think before. Um, Hurricane Maria municipalities were really strapped. I mean, the whole island was strapped. I mean, the economic crisis was going on. And so um, a lot of the municipalities are working with half-time staff. You know, there was a lot of layoffs. I mean, you guys all know kind of the issues as far as the resources. But it's like, at this time, you know, it, it's critical that everybody's at the table for disaster planning. So, you know, we've worked in these spaces before. We're working kind of at these, um, at these community levels. And collaboratively, we'll be able to address that um, working from within. Um, these communities. So that's something that we're hoping to, to start on deck. And so I think um, someone mentioned disaster fatigue. So I think that um, the, the emergency period for Puerto Rico was much longer um, than in other places. And, um, you know, we're just kind of entering into that space with the, the recovery. Um, you know, just yes, Thursday, um, the CDBG DR action plan has been available, which kind of programs a lot of the, um, the HUD dollars that are coming in for disaster, which includes a lot of um, support for planning activities. So it is definitely something that's gonna be starting soon. And I think that we're, we're getting to that space. So that's just kind of what we're doing. And again, I think we also rely on local expertise. Um, you know, we're not, we're not experts in every community. So that's really valuable to us to work with communities on the ground um, in order to inform what that needs to look like for each community. I know. Just, just so everyone knows, uh, um, that 95% of the island is restored, that's a lot. Uh, that 95% of the island is restored, that's, that's not true. Um, that's not true. No, no, no. I was mean, actually there, like I actually worked on the power lines and all that stuff, and it's more like about 60%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, just to, I don't know if Monica, but in terms of habitat, uh, Habitat has, uh, is obviously doing the reconstruction and con new construction, but as well, it's focusing on rebuilding, rebuilding better. And it has a program that's called Pathways to Permanence. And we are uh, inserting uh, Puerto Rico in the areas that we're gonna serve in, uh, to be able to um, you know, give them the resources to know how to live. Another, I don't wanna be, I'm always the one, who, but it, Puerto Rico is not only prone to hur hurricanes, it's, pr it's prone to earthquakes and yeah. nobody's talking about that. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and tsunamis, that, and tsunamis. And that is an issue, uh, an issue that yeah. we have to take into consideration with the housing. Um, a lot of people think cement homes are, you know, you get it's equals progress and all these families, it's, it's uh, interesting that they're asking for cement roofs uh, and they don't really know, you know, until you don't experiment uh, uh, what the aftermath of, a, of an earthquake, then we're going to be starting talking about. So we're trying to integrate both things and be able to build uh, correctly so that we are able to to help in the event of, of, of any one of those two events. I think that there's a there's um, I think that there's a, a big problem in that sense that we identify from the beginning when we started working and trying to kind of help in ways of educating people uh, we noticed that there's actually a great number of guides that have been developed on safe construction against you know hurricanes and earthquakes and everything 
I mean, there is a lot, not only for Puerto Rico, but for other tropical areas that apply the same way to Puerto Rico. So the, the question that, that we were confronted with was like, why is this information not out there? Mm -hmm. um, and why is it that every time that a disaster hits, we, we actually have people start actually going through the same ideas and being like, oh, we're gonna do these guides. We're gonna actually, uh, even like the professional organizations do the same thing and they actually um, kind of get, out, get these guides out there on safe construction. But there's a, there's a problem in actually getting that, that uh, knowledge to the members of the communities. I think it's something that, that stays in professional circles and that actually doesn't really get out there. And one of the reasons that it doesn't get out there is because of the way that the information is, um, the way that the information is shown. I think it's not really like, it's not shown for the average person. The average person doesn't really understand like technical terms and stuff like that. Um, and as I said at the beginning, that gap between the professionals and the members of the community, like there's this whole technical aspect that people want to implement, but people are, the regular people that are rebuilding their homes are not, are not interested in that. They're, so I, I think that there, there needs to be a way that we can kind of bridge that gap and get the information across to people. Uh, specifically also in terms of earthquakes. I think we've mentioned it like multiple times and people just ignore it because it's like, it, it's too much to think about the hurricane. People don't even want to talk about earthquakes, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everyone can show hands? Because it's one o'clock. I don't know if you want to, uh, one, two, three. I'm going to go from here to there, okay? I'm, uh, um. So I don't have a question. Okay, um, so maybe. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm Betty Medina Lichtenstein, and I'm from Holyoke, Massachusetts. We have received an enormous amount of um, displaced hurricane victims, and um, as we do intakes, this whole informal um, housing has come up. Do you own the house? Do you not own the house? Um, and so we also are the ones that are assisting them with their FEMA uh, resources, okay? So when they cannot um, show that they are the owners of the property, then we process them as if they are tenants, right? Um, because there's no other way. Um, if not, they do not become eligible for any resources at all. A concern that I have, and it's about policy and also legal, is, is that as they um, start getting their permits, and they have also um, been able to receive FEMA resources. Where will there be a, um, a FEMA government um, implications for them to pay back the money? Because if they were owners of the property, they would have been asked to do an SBA application for a loan versus a tenant um, that then is just going to, could be receiving rental assistance for the 18 months, um, uh, personal property, everyone would qualify for it. So I just want to kind of put that in the parking lot that as people um, are going to go through the process, and I'm hoping that the HUD funds are not going to be used for that, um, which is something else that has been kind of uh, talked about, um, is assisting families in getting the permits, well, during that process, then they be required to pay back any monies that they were able to get as uh, what they were being considered as a tenant. It happened in, um, in New Orleans and people were, uh, their income taxes were taken. Um, that's how the government was able uh, to get all that money back. And I'm hoping, given that what people have gone through, that that is not going to be uh, something that's gonna be put on them. So I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so I had a, uh, my name is Marilyn Figueroa, um, born in Bronx, New York, moved to Miami, and I live in DC. Um, I have a question kind of um, based off of a situation that I'm uh, going through with my family. So my mom's moving to San Juan in two weeks. And I'm curious to know the attitudes and the resources regarding stateside um, Puerto Ricans that are interested in moving to the island and are there, is there community around that? Is there resources? Is there um, resources specifically on how to access um, housing? She wants to rent. She's not gonna, she's not in a position to 
to buy or own, plus it seems like it, there's a lot of um, uh, <clears throat> struggle that she would have to go to in order to even own on the island anyway. But I'm just curious, like, what are, what are the attitudes regarding um, the long-term benefits of, of not only Puerto Ricans who moved away from the island because of the disaster, but Puerto Ricans from um, stateside that want to move? Is there any? Anything that you can speak to about. <laughs> <laughs> Does, is anybody here from Puerto Rico that lives currently in Puerto Rico that, that would like to? <laughs> I, I, I haven't perceived a bias. Um, there is a, a population of Americans that are there that don't have Puerto Rican heritage that sometimes profess that there's prejudice, but I think it's the uh, Extremely privileged for Puerto Rican to live in Puerto Rico because immediately you uh, are free of any kind of reading or being a minority group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are the primary citizens of the island. It's a good place to live. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I actually think that's why um, uh, she went to St. Thomas for a um, she works for Home Depot, she's a manager at Home Depot, and she went to St. Thomas, and they only have one store there. And so they have repaired and had a, a massive hiring event. This was about a month and a half ago. She fell in love with it, and she said, I want to go to Puerto Rico, and I want to be there, and I want to be a part of the economy, I want to be a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's something that I would want to consider for myself as well. But I'm just curious, well, I haven't been there, so how do I, how do I, even, how do I even assist her in getting connected? How do I get connected? Uh, what are the resources, and is that even an idea that's being thought about or talked about um, in terms of helping the island in the future, having other Boricuas, even stateside, part of the di diaspora, coming to the island? We have a gentleman in the back. Yeah, hi, how are you? Uh, I moved back in 2015 after leaving 23 years in this um, What I would tell you is that I think that it was a change this time. I think the, the, the yeah. 12 year old depression that uh, has seen you know, people in the island has changed attitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we who live there now, now that I live there, I think for three years now, um, we realize that uh, we are becoming a, you know, a population that's uh, basically going slowly but surely down. And with the hurricane, obviously, that, that process is elevated. So uh, I don't think that. Uh, where Puerto maybe for like, oh, well, you know, it's bad that people are coming back. <laughs> They're trying to attract people to come back. And, and Especially you know, if you have a mentality of helping and yeah. providing yeah. resources. So, uh, I think, you know, right now, uh, your mother will be welcome with, with open arms. So. Okay. Yeah, I think that something's beautiful. Something let's do that. Something positive that the hurricane provided is that sometimes the relationship with, between the, the Puerto Ricans who live in the states and Puerto Ricans, it was we thought of each other as mm -hmm. or at least the people in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. But I think this has has created a, something positive has created a, a bond and, and 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 noting that there's no difference and, and that we need to Puerto Rico has expanded itself and how do you give back to that and how we receive you with open arms and how do we you know work with this together it's for the benefit of Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans. There's an issue of jobs. I'm sorry? There's an issue of jobs and, and so you got to be very careful that you're not taking you know up. creating uh, uh, creating more competition for less jobs. Mm -hmm. So if she's going down there for a job mm -hmm. you know people on the island are going to feel displaced by it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I mean, I don't know that it'll happen personally to her, but it's an issue that's been mm -hmm. raised, uh, and you know, so I would, that would be a caution. But the other flow would be as what happened with southern cities like Atlanta, where uh, the black middle class families here in New York came upon retirement age. They sold their co-ops and rents from here and yeah. moved to the south. That wealth was welcome to put their arms because they, they weren't competing with jobs. Job. Bringing mm -hmm. So Puerto Ricans that are in government that are retiring say, you know what, I'm going to move to Puerto Rico. They're bringing their wealth with them. They're going to be like, baby, come on. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. If you're going down as a retiree, you're going to be loved. <laughs> if you're going down to compete for a job, you're not going to be loved. But you will be accepted eventually. Well, she's actually transferring. Just so, you know, <laughs> she, she works for Home Depot. There's a great need for um, having 
Puerto Ricans no, and sure. make incorporation yeah. like home people yeah. invest in, in, in Puerto Rico. Right. So, I mean, but that, just that sensitivity. That no, is, yeah, you, know, it's, that, yeah. you cannot like not talk about it. That the, it's yeah. competitive. Yeah. I don't. Uh, Anna and, and Lina. Um, first of all, just to address the, this issue, but there's another one I want to talk about. Um, uh, right now, Anyone who moves to Puerto Rico is welcome. They're leaving, so I would say May and Mo be the first to start creating a group of states and yeah. Puerto Ricans. And I would say open our statistics to the global diaspora, mm -hmm. not only in the United States. How many Puerto Ricans have been looking at for? I can't find it. Are we globally? Mm -hmm. And you know, try and bring them back. As to some of the discussion around enterprise uh, partner. The community partners, I'd like to um, bring because I'm collaborating with, with them from the university. I know there's been some you know, insinuations, or maybe there's a corporate agenda behind what they're doing. But I would like to say that what I've witnessed in collaboration with them is, is um, a very uh, passionate commitment and, and an incredible drive to try and generate uh, with uh, this guide, the Housing Resilience Guide. Resilience guide. I can't. We can't guarantee it's going to work. Part of the problem with helping five communities, as Erica says, or, or whatnot. There's another layer that we can, with whom we're collaborating within enterprise that's trying to generate this guide, which Monica mentioned. There have been many in the past for housing resilience, and the guide is becoming a hopefully tool. Because the disaster here in Puerto Rico, or here, I think I'm still at home, mm -hmm. is 3.2 million people. There's just no way that we can help every community individual, individually. That specific guide actually is aimed at trying to empower the community and create a very simple and visually accessible guide that they can, we have a problem of literacy in some of these communities, especially with the diaspora from the Dominican Republic, which lives in many of these low-income communities, mm -hmm. that it would be visual, visually attractive and that they, you know, mm -hmm. somehow would understand how to better anchor their structures and how to get organized as a community. It's, it's trying to cover many bases. So it's, I think it's an interesting way of trying to make um, a document that's easily readable by those who can read and those who cannot, and about issues that span housing to getting a community organized and identifying the safe structures within their community and having a safe haven and understanding that even if you do enter your home, maybe it's not a place where you should ride out the storm. I'm trying to help uh, communities um, start looking at their community in the bigger picture you down bigger from a reservoir, are you in the flood range? There are different things that because we can't just go out five communities out of three point five two million, you know, we need tools. And um, enterprise has the commitment to try and have this published and, 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 and um, uh, deliver these copies of this manual across the island. So I, I think there's another layer yeah. of commitment that's trying to address all those communities that just can't reach. But I'm sorry to interrupt. How many more questions? Because we, we're running 15 minutes. Um, let me, can they, the, the people who haven't participated, and then if you can. My name is Gisela Rodriguez. I am from uh, Puerto Rico. I just want to address just a few things that all of you um, uh, talked about. And, and the first one is, and I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Um, you said collaboration is, is critical, it's important, and I totally agree with that. Um, we have, um, we are actually on a mission, my husband and I. That's why Cody was raising his, his hand as well. Um, well I'll and, answer some more. So, so, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, Pretty soon, we'll be going to Puerto Rico, especially to Ayuya. We are from Ayuya, the center of the island. And that's a very rural community. It's, it's an agricultural, forgotten kind of community. And we're going to go there to rebuild. That's, that's our mission. That's our project. Are you Anna or this cousin? Yes, Anna Maria. Yes, yes. 
So <laughs> Puerto so, Rico's are so, <laughs> so collaboration in your absolutely not because we've been telling him we had no idea. We, we knew that we wanted to do something. Um, we had no, no idea what to do, but we contacted Habitat for Humanity in Tallahassee. And they've been really they've been amazing as far as providing you know the technical expertise information for us to be able to do this. Um, we're about to you know go and, and, and rebuild and do. And going back to what uh, Monica um, talked about uh, a few minutes ago when she said there's there's urgency and, and I understand everything she was addressing and I'm so glad that she touched on everything because. I do understand it's critical at this point in time um, to do things better, not to just you know repeat the same mistakes and to rebuild and do things you know, COVID and, and, and complying with everything. But at the same time, there is an urgency. We were there in January in Puerto Rico and we went to Hallelujah and we saw the destruction. And this was in January. Nothing has happened since January. People are still without roots. <laughs> I mean, we are in contact communication with the mayor of Hayuya. He is literally counting the minutes until we go to Hayuya. We have machines that were donated from uh, organizations, not organizations, uh, businesses, local companies in Tallahassee. We have a lot of materials that we're going to, you know, take to Hayuya. And we're just going to do it. And going back to um, Monica's point, yes, there is a lot of expertise in the town, in the community. There's a lot of people that are willing and able to help us with what needs to be done. In the meantime, then we can do all of this, which is absolutely essential, which is the, the planning, the how do we make this better? How do we get the community to, to feel better, to get the titles, to get all of that? Because that is essential. I mean, if we, if we don't address that, Forget it, we're not, right. this is just not going to matter. Mm -hmm. But there's also this urgency, and we cannot lose sight of that. We, we, we have to address that, and hopefully, we're going to be able to do that when we go back pretty soon. Well, Your mom will be welcome in Puerto Rico. What I found with Post Maria mm -hmm. is correct. I, we have lived outside of Puerto Rico for 25 years, and we are we are doing this privately. Um, what I did find was conflicting issues with dealing with organizations in Puerto Rico. That's what I found. And of course, as a businessman, I made decisions internally. And these organizations, they're still going to go with me, but they're going to go in a private capacity. They're not going to go on behalf of an organization. They're going with me with my foundation, but they're taking time off from work, and I still get the expertise, and I'm going to get it done. But I did found issues with dealing with local groups and organizations in Puerto Rico. The other issue I found is that the merchants in Puerto Rico, they're taking advantage of the people in terms of the supplies and the materials. Like I'm going to be bringing um, roofing materials that I'm going to buy here in the state for 70 cents a square feet, delivered to Hayuya. And the same materials, a homeowner has to pay over $4 a square feet. Wow. That always happens after because when you tell like, if you yeah. can get it, they have to redo their roof. And you know, our project, I, uh, I did a study with uh, my subject matter experts when we went to Hayuya, and our cost for a roof is four hundred dollars mm -hmm. delivered to Hayuya. That same roof, a homeowner goes to Home Depot or to a local hardware, it will cost them. $4,000 plus the evil, plus the tax. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so I think from a person to go there and leave and bring the, it's okay. I think the issue that I'm finding is the organization and the merchants and the, you know, it, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. so, do you want to? Well, I think we're probably out of time, but I, first of all, I want to commend you guys for being in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm highly excited about starting this thing. And I, uh, when people tell me how Puerto Rico doing, I always start with housing. If you don't have a roof, what kind of life are you having? Yeah. Uh, number two, I just met with Julian Asaya, the mayor of Loisa, two Fridays ago. And and basically, the first part to Loisa, I got there 90 days after 
after the hurricane. So it shows uh, uh, to me, and I guess I came to this panel to try to see what advice you ladies had have on, on, on the housing sector, because for me, I don't see a coordinated strategy. No. A lot of people are talking about informal. We know about the people without titles, we're attorneys, we try to help them. But there's also, I know a lot of professionals that have left Puerto Rico in their house, just has a poor sales sign. Mm -hmm. And I also, we were talking about data, I was like, why are you not getting the website of credit? You know, 15 years ago, Puerto Rico was established, in 1992, 93, so it was more than that. Puerto Rico style is a local property tax. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with my mom to try to pay the crime. So <laughs> the property of the farm in Moca is under somebody else's name. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And they don't have the data. The yeah, they yeah. Have. So, so for me, I, I was hoping that uh, I don't know if it's going to be a CBG fund, you know, the new conference fund, community development conference. Uh, but I, I don't see a, co a coordinated strategy of the stock. I don't see a legal initiative from the legislature. Here we are, eight months. The Senate is opening an office in DC, and nobody has passed a bill to say, let's expedite the titles. Yeah. I don't want people to get titles. Yeah. To me, since, the, since this administration came into power, I guess last Friday, they gave, I mean, it was 20 titles. They've done 150 titles. Oh, I'm in the Army. I'm, an army. I'm running a unit at 150 for 3.5 million people. You want to move in the needle. Right. Yes, yes. So I don't see any, see, I just, I see efforts, but I don't see a coordinated strategy saying, hey, do we need to raise property taxes so that those houses that are non-residents, just like you do in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't live on it, you pay 1% a year on the property value so that we move to stock. Because we have a lot of people that are just holding to stock. We're talking about cultures. Yeah. People are buying houses and saying, they'll come back. Yeah. And you yeah. see a lot of houses that are just empty. Mm -hmm. Good houses, when you see, so, so I, I see that I don't see a strategy whether it's to help with the data, whether it's to help with titles, mm -hmm. or whether it is to help mm -hmm. ensure that that excess stock gets there. Because I can, you know, I can tell you my parents are 80 and 84, and you know they're in a big house. And I'm like, how are you guys here? This should be a house with more little kids. Like when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. yeah. enjoyed this house, but they pay so little cream. But they might as well stay in that house. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, I think you summarized all yeah. the points. Yeah. And, and <laughs> thank you. Because, um, how do we go from the, from now from this? And well, you're the guys right. right. I think no. we're, <laughs> no, we're, we're trying to yeah. gather all our knowledge and see how we can provide. A, a yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of coordination. I mean, you know, the stories we've heard, the experiences we've had. You know, just even in developing, and I'll just be honest with this development of this plan, right? You know how many other plans are also in development at the same time? They're be talking about the same strategies and yeah, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, and it's an expertise coming here from there, right? So it's 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 not it's it's disjointed. Um, you know, I think that there'll be a time period where the dust settles. The emergencies are still emergencies, you know, and we do need to focus on that. And not everyone needs to focus on that too. That's also kind of like everybody needs to follow the same ball. I think that's how we work more coordinated. I don't have all the answers. I don't have probably any of the answers, but I know that there's opportunities for people to work together and, and they have been, you know, so I think of one of these efforts with the nonprofits and municipalities, it's like, they realize they're like, oh, we overserved this community. We kept going there with water, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't, nobody had water, yeah. right? And nobody realized that data is so important in order to manage yeah. that. So I think there's a lot of recognition. I think everybody where you're at, it's just, it's not coordinated. And there's a lot of work to do. And I think the advocacy from the diaspora and other groups to push as far as like we need that structure and that framework in order to be more coordinated, to get stuff done. Because if not, we're just kind of, you know, kinetic energy running around in circles and what's really going to get done. So from the data perspective, there's two points. It took Maria for us to discuss Maria at Central. So um, there's two things. One, um, the data source that's in this report is from the Market Community Survey. Two, HUDs, um, they have a data source where they have post, um, like postal officers, like the distribute, um, you know. Um, so they actually have that data, and if they go to a house that's vacant, they put like a code there, right? So it's commercial. So that's another data source that we're trying to, to map as well, right? So correlate, like what is the percentage of homes that are vacant? Is it vacant because there's someone that's, um, 
not living there, they have the for sale sign for X amount of time. So that's another way that we're trying to, to, to have that data available. Two, with the remote sensing um, um, images, that's another way that we're trying to um, um, bring together to, to see like, hey, like, this is where they're located, this is the number of homes that are, um, et cetera. So there's different ways that we're trying to do. The green database. That's only the green database. That we're, we're trying to get that as well. So again, it took Maria for us to discuss this type of work and we're trying to, you know, put forth that work. Actually, I'm kind of glad we didn't put this paper out because there's more to be done and more um, sections to be added. But yes, from a data perspective, we're trying to have that available and also through our website to have um, that data downloadable for, for you and folks. Then, and it's not, it's not yeah. let that island government. The problem is Puerto Rico's data allergic. And you talk about CRIM, but uh, um, the CRIM website is not up, up to date and yeah. because there's no repercussions to talk about that they haven't done policy, the, the most important policy because nobody wants to implement it. Uh, right now, the property taxes, it's so difficult to explain. They're from 1952 because yeah, nobody wants to reassess. You reassess because it's going to cost them the election, but you know, at some point, somebody's got to take the right. Well, by the I'll tell you, I'll use my dad as an example. He's been in that property. He's 76 years old, and that's a family property. He pays $100 a year property. Oh, my God. God. Because he claims a homestead. <laughs> and I'm not, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and I also, on the title thing, when we did the survey, I saw a Families that were denied by FEMA, they're being in this home over a hundred years. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They, I talked to a gentleman that he was 28 years old. His dad got to that property when he was one day old. He died at age 93, and his son, which is the guy I'm talking to, is 58. FEMA knocking him for the title, and he said, The title of what? He's read it somewhere. Yeah. And, and he's been there, and FEMA is asking the local government. The local government should have helped. I know. I agree with you. You know how many families have fallen apart? In Puerto Rico? Sorry? Well, he got the knife. Familia in Puerto Rico? There. We're being cut, but I know. I think um, what we're trying to do here is we know the problems. Now, how do we be, how do we how do we converge and find a solution? Uh, and I I think here we, we, the reality is that the, we can't wait for the government to do it. We have to align ourselves and work separately.